So today we are going to discuss parasitic weeds. Okay, let, let me check something. Right, somebody was trying to join. So we'll resume our discussion on the parasitic weeds. The objectives today are three. First, by the end of the lecture or discussion, we should be able to identify parasitic weeds and their symptoms on the horse. We should also be able to understand the biology of the parasitic weeds. And the last important thing is to be able to understand the general control strategies. This first slide is showing us the parasitic weed Striga asiatica. It's this plant here with the red flowers. Again, the striga asiatica with the red flowers. You can see there are other weeds like Pyrosa in the same field, Tagitas minuta here. This is a maize field in Gope. This maize is being attacked by Striga asiatica. Uh, this is the in the low world. You can see the plant. The, the, the striker near the, the near the maize uh, near the maize uh, plant, and it is uh, having some. It's starting to flower. I can see some uh, red flowers. This was supplied by Mr. Dembure. Thank you very much for the photo showing what is happening in the low veld. This maze has already been affected. You can see it is short. Sorry. You can see another interesting uh, thing about the maze is that uh, the leaves are already rolling, showing some uh, drought stress symptoms. Yet, if you look at the ground, it is very wet. So one of the symptoms of striga is that uh, it can induce drought stress symptoms in a maize uh, plant. Here it use it sometimes we evaluate uh, maize genotypes for their resistance or uh, tolerance. Uh, we use uh, pots for this kind of study. You can see 
maize which was grown in a pot uh, infested with the striker. You can see the striker which has emerged in the pot. One of course uh, plant emerged at the bottom here. And this leaf drying is uh, caused by striker. This is Striga asiatica uh, in Gokwe. You can see these plants here. And the maize is quite uh, standard. Again, this is in Gokwe where Striga was a serious problem in some places. You can see we have got some uh, farmers who have uprooted this uh, striker, showing that uh, it's there, it's one of their problems. This is a student, Stanford was working uh, in Gokwe, evaluating some varieties there. You know the chairperson here, Professor Gasura. Again, here is why in the Gokwe where the farmers are showing us uh, the striker. But you can see this plant here, the maize with a big cob. It's some of the lines which were being uh, evaluated by Professor Gasura in Gokwe. Now we have got uh, various types of uh, strains of uh, striker. Uh, we can have striker asiatica with the yellow flowers. This one was collected in the northern uh, part of Zimbabwe, in the northern part of uh, Mashoda and uh, Central. And it has white flowers. This is the common one with the red flowers. So we've got white and red and some variations in between. Sometimes when you you are evaluating uh, genotypes for resistance. You may find that one variant may be, uh, the maize may be tolerated to one variant, but susceptible to the other. So it may be very difficult to make some recommendations. The best thing is to screen the genotypes across many strains so that uh, probably we can get uh, a stable genotype. This is Stregaphobsii. Now Stregaphobsii is a larger plant compared to Striga asiatica. In Zimbabwe, it has been reported in the Kadoma area, Chegutu. Then when we go to areas around Kwekwe, it has also been uh, reported. It is quite devastating, but uh, it's not widespread compared to Striga asiatica. This is Striga gesneroids. This one uh, attacks tobacco in this country. It is these uh, purplish flowers. So where tobacco is grown, especially in Mvuma, and some parts of Chegutu. But uh, this problem started to emerge when tobacco 
was now being grown by many farmers, especially in the newly resettled areas around the Mvuma. That is when farmers started to report it as a problem. Again, this is a striker gesneroids uh, at the flowering stage. This is, again is the parasite, which is attached to the tobacco roots. This is a, a tobacco field in the background. And what you see here is the root system of tobacco where striga gesneroids is attached. This is in Mvuma and the photo was supplied by Dr. Koga who did a lot of research uh, in tobacco. This is the tobacco which has been affected by strigages neroids. You can see the leaves uh, have been damaged. The reason why you have a leaves being uh, damaged, I will explain about it. The striker can cause what is known as a photo inhibition. It affects the uh, photosynthesis. And a lot of uh, oxygen radicals are formed, which will actually bend the leaves. <clears throat> this is Electra vogeri. It's a parasitic weed which attacks cowpeas. Uh, it attacks uh, leguminous uh, crops. In Malawi, they have reported it on groundnuts, but we rarely see it on groundnuts in Zimbabwe. We have seen it on cowpeas and the bambara nuts. This then is a, a bambara nut crop, and you can see this uh, electra which is parasitizing the bambara nut. Again, we have got the bambara nut, and this is the electra, which is having some uh, uh, yellow flowers. It has sort of uh, yellow flowers. Again, this is Electra in the cowpeas where the student was screening some uh, uh, cowpeas for resistance. You can see the cowpeas were planted in pots. That is where we are getting the uh, Electra for jerry flowers. This one is Cascuta cambestris. Uh, you can see this thin yellowish plant with the, a lot of uh, stems, which looks like uh, strings, which are attached to this other plant. And it has uh, these whitish uh, flowers. Well, some people will describe it, it looks like a spaghetti. You can see this spaghetti-like structures. 
of Cascuta Cambestris. This one is Ramticapa fistulosa. It is found parasitizing uh, rice. Uh, normally we see it in the flay areas. I've actually seen this weed in Mashingo, in Mshagashi area where farmers uh, grow rice in wetlands. And it was affecting their rice. So that is this plant. This one, which you are seeing on a tree, this is structure here, is actually a parasitic plant, which is found on trees. And it is known as the mistru toe. It's quite common in some areas, but we find it uh, in non-agricultural areas. Maybe it may affect uh, plantation crops, but we don't have uh, reports uh, as such. But it's an interesting uh, parasite. So it is this one. We call it a shoot parasite. Both it attacks uh, the shoots. There's a paper uh, which was uh, written by these authors. Uh, you may read it if you are interested about these uh, mist tools which attack uh, trees. Probably they may attack plantation crops. So it's important to have some idea about these uh, parasites. But in, for agricultural purposes, we have not yet some reports about the problems of uh, mistral tools. Boom rep or bungee species with uh, bluish flowers. This one attacks tomatoes and uh, most of the horticultural uh, crops. It is found in Saudi Arabia, around the Mediterranean uh, Sea in Europe. There have been some reports in. Uh, Ethiopia, but uh, otherwise it's not a problem in the southern part of Africa and indeed in some other parts of Africa with the exception of uh, probably Ethiopia and Somalia which are nearer to the Saudi Arabia. So what are parasitic weeds? These plants cannot exist on their own. They need to get carbon and mineral salts from other plants, which we call the host. And there's a specialized structure which enables parasitic weeds to get uh, carbon and uh, mineral salts. This structure is called, is termed Ostoria. We've got, uh, <coughs> we've got uh, local names for which weeds. Uh, some people call it Ibise. Some call it Rombi, others call it Isona. I think in Matabedrent they refer to it as Isona. Now we can classify 
parasitic weeds in various ways. If a parasite is attached to the shoot, we refer to it as the shoot parasite. So this will be your host, and the position where the parasite is attached is the shoot. Like the mistral too, and the cascuta, cabestris. You have your host, and if the parasite is attaching on the root, it is classified as a root parasite. So we could use the position where we find the parasite to classify them, either shoot or root. Secondly, we can use the color of the parasite. Uh, in this case, we are referring to chlorophyll. Now, the parasites which contain chlorophyll are known as hemiparasites because they can at least photosynthesize and manufacture partly some of the uh, uh, food requirements. Then we do have uh, those parasites which do not contain chlorophyll. They are known as holoparasites as opposed to hemiparasites. Uh, for example, the orobanchi, which I showed you with the uh, bluish flowers, and I said in Africa we do not have it as a serious problem. It's restricted in uh, Ethiopia and probably Somalia, but it's a serious problem in Saudi Arabia and the countries around the Mediterranean Sea. So we do have these two uh, types of parasites, hemiparasites and holoparasites. Then there's some some other parasite which doesn't fit this classification, it's in between. It can be a oroparasite or a hemiparasite, and that is Kescuta. It forms the boundary between holo and hemiparasitism. It has a bit of chlorophyll, but not much. Now, Parasitic weeds can cause serious uh, yield losses. It was reported that uh, in Africa, the area which is affected by parasites was estimated to be 73 million hectares, where cereal production was occurring. And this area was affected by parasitic weeds. As far as the actual losses are concerned, Sobon in 1991 estimated the grain yield losses of up to 6 to 21%. Kim in 1991 estimated losses up to 40%. But uh, it must be noted that uh, cereals may actually fail to produce grain in some cases. So it could be 100% yield, uh, yield loss. Here we have got uh, a table showing us uh, common parasitic weeds in Zimbabwe. The most common one is Striga asiatica, which attacks maize, sorghum, millet, and sugarcane. 
in the lower world. Uh, we have got a uh, striker FOPCI. Actually, striker Asiatica is the one which is uh, widely distributed in Zimbabwe. Then we have got the striker FOPCI, which also attacks maize, sorghum, millet, and sugarcane. But this one is restricted around the Kadoma area and the Kweko area. <clears throat> <clears throat> then we have got striga gesneroids or gesneroids which attacks tobacco and cowpea. So, hello? Hello? How are you doing? Can you please, please let me in there? Uh, okay. Uh, sorry about the phone call. I want to admit somebody. Okay, so we get the resume. Sorry about the interruption, somebody was trying to join. We have got striker just steroids, which I said it takes tobacco and uh, cowpea. But uh, in this country, we have not seen uh, striker gesneroids attacking a uh, cowpea. In other countries like West Africa, striker gesneroids has been observed to attack cowpea. In Zimbabwe, Strega gesneroids is believed to attack uh, other wild uh, plants. We had the uh, Dr. Koga who was working for Tobacco Research Board, who tried to collect some species around Zimbabwe, and he found striga gesneroids uh, on a uh, Ricardia Scabra, for example, uh, around the Mount Darwin area, where there are some uh, tobacco farmers there. But when he did a genetic uh, analysis of the strigages and roids from different uh, plants, He found that uh, the strike on tobacco was totally different from the strike gesneroids, which is assumed to be attacking Ricardia scabra and other plants. So that question still needs to be resolved. Both people still think Striga gesneroids is attacking these other plants. But uh, genetic analysis has shown that uh, these are totally different plants. 
Another parasite is Electra vogeri, which attacks Bambara nuts and the cowpeas. Then we have got a Cascuta cambestris, which attacks uh, Lucene. It has also been reported on some horticultural uh, crops, uh, such as carrots and the tomatoes. Probably there is one which you may not be see, which is not visible on the slide, which is Ramphicapa fistulosa. This one attacks rice grown in wetlands. And uh, it has been reported around the Mashingo area in Mshagash. Now the striga species or the para parasitic uh, weeds can be classified according to their plant families. Most of the parasitic weeds belong to the Orobangasi family. And then the Orobangasi family, we have got Striga Asiatica, Striga Fobsiae, Striga Jesneroids, Electra Vogeri, and Ramphicapa Fistulosa. So most of the parasitic weeds belong to that Orobangasi family. Then we have got Cascuta cambestris. This one belongs to the Cascutasi plant family, or sometimes it comes under the Convolvulaci uh, plant family. But otherwise, most of our parasitic weeds belong to the Orobangasi family with the exception of Cascuta cambestris. Something which is quite unique about parasitic weeds is the seed size. They have very, very small uh, seeds. For example, Electra vogeri has got a seed length of 0 0.2 millimeters and its weight is about 0 0.3 micrograms. Striga asiatica has got 0 0.33 millimeters length and 3.7 micrograms. Striga Fobsiae has got 0 0.5 millimeters and 12.4 micrograms. But uh, just to summarize it, we can just say the seed look like dust. Probably this can uh, give us an idea about the size of the seeds. Seed production, each plant, for example, Saiga asiatica can produce about 25,000 seeds per plant, Striga fobsia about 58,000 seeds, 58, seeds per plant. But uh, some have actually quoted 100,000 seeds or around that range for an individual plant. 
and these seeds can stay in the soil for a long time, up to 20 years, what we call seed uh, longevity. So even if you are imposing uh, some long-term uh, weed control methods, it may take a long time probably to realize the impact of such control methods. This then is the strike asiatic seed. You now this, you can see this under microscope. It has got this uh, shape. They look like a small snails, you know, under a microscope. This is Cascuta campestris uh, seed. It's quite uh, smooth. It's not as rough as that of Striga asiatica. Now, this is the world distribution of uh, parasitic weeds. You can find that uh, in Africa, we have a lot of parasitic weed, things like uh, Striga asiatica. There's also what is known as Striga emonthica. Uh, in West Africa and East Africa. And this tiger emontica can go up to Tanzania. And in, in West Africa alone, there could be what is known as striga aspera. And the uh, Electra vogeri can cover the whole uh, part of Africa. This whole area here we find the uh, Electra vocheri. And even uh, Striga gisneroids is also widely distributed. Now in India, there is Striga asiatica with the white flowers. Then there's one part of, uh, you, small part of USA where there was a uh, strike asiatica, it's still there, they are trying to control it, but uh, it isn't uh, spread out of that uh, small uh, area. It, around the Mediterranean area, this is where we find the Orobangi and in the Sud Arabia. So you can see in, it is in Africa, especially south of the Sahara, you know, where we have serious problems. Now in Zimbabwe, most of the dry areas have uh, parasitic uh, weeds. And since sometimes we have a lot of drought, we find that the parasitic weeds are now entering the former wet areas. So most of the areas in Zimbabwe have parasitic weeds, but they are more prevalent uh, in dry areas like natural region five, four, and uh, three. Now we want to look at the life cycle of the parasitic weed. Okay, wait a bit, let me check something. Okay, somebody was trying to get in, sorry about that. Okay, let us now talk about the life cycle of a uh, striker. Because if we are going to control it, we need to understand the life cycle. Now, 
Now the life cycle starts with the seeds. And we have said that the seeds are very small. They are like dust. Now, before the seeds of striga can germinate, they require exposure to the moisture for a period of one to three weeks. And the temperature should be around 25 degrees uh, to 35 degrees Celsius. So for that period, where you have soil, where you have moisture, and those temperatures, 25 to 35, is what we call the preconditioning period. We have tried to germinate these seeds, and our preconditioning period was. Uh, two weeks. We found that probably two weeks was too much because we were getting uh, less germinations. So we adjusted our preconditioning period to one week and we were getting very good germinations from the striga seeds under laboratory conditions. Now, after germination, the seedlings or the radicals of the striga seeds need to get attached to the roots of the host. Now, for them to get attached the host has to produce uh, stimulants, which makes it possible for the uh, radicals to be directed to the host, or you require the germination stimulants to trigger that germination after the end of the preconditioning uh, period. Now, some of the substances or stimulants which we have, we've got examples like Strigor. Strigor was the first uh, germination stimulant to be identified uh, from cotton, although cotton doesn't support uh, the growth of the striker. The other uh, substance is known as the sogolion. Then we have got uh, sogolacton and the electron. All together, these are classified as strigolactons. I will explain later about this. Now, the striga is germinated. The next thing is that it has to get attached to the root. And before it gets attached to the root, what is required is uh, another substance known as 2,6-DMBQ, which facilitates the uh, attachment. Uh, 2,6-DMBQ is, is not the only uh, chemical which is involved. There are plenty, and some of them have not yet been identified. Together, they are classified as Wostoria initiation factors, represented by HIF 
or storia initiation factors. And one example is 2,6-DMBQ, which makes it possible for the attachment. Now, when the attachment is uh, taken place, the parasite can take up to a month or 30 days underground. And this is when the parasite is causing serious damage here. That is when it is causing serious damage. And the frustration of the farmer is that uh, the farmer cannot see the wheat because it is not yet imaged. Even if they want it to wheat, the, the field looks clean because the, what is damaging the crop is still underground. So this is one of the challenges of controlling uh, parasitic weeds. Eventually, it will emerge. And it takes about, again, 30 days or another month to produce flowers and seed. Now, after seed production, the life cycle is completed. So the seed, which is shed at the end of the season, will undergo precondition, uh, will undergo after ripening period, uh, which can take place up to three months before it can uh, germinate. So that is the summary of the life cycle. So if I could just indicate, I said you start with the seeds and you need preconditioning, that is exposure to moisture under the temperature 25 to at least 35 degrees. And the period could be one to two weeks or three weeks, but we found that one week for laboratory conditions, one week was enough. Then after that period, the seed is now ready to respond to chemical signals which are coming from the host. This is the Striga, which has germinated, you can see the the, radic the white long radicals. Now this was germinated in agar gel in the petri dishes uh, under incubation with the exclusion of light. We took these pictures from one of the students who was screening uh, maize genotypes for striker resistance. This is the maize root. You can see this is the striker which has germinated and is now attached to the, it is now attached to the uh, maize root. And at the point of attachment, that is where you have the Ostoria. Again, this is in Agajero. So the germination stimulants are known as strigalactones. And we've got a list of them. We've got strigal, isolated from cotton. We have got sogolion and sogolactone. We have got 
this there was an attempt by scientists to produce uh, artificial uh, stray galactons. They copied the structure of Strigor and produced what is known as GR24. The idea was to make this a herbicide so that you spray it to the soil and you fool the seeds, thinking that uh, probably there's, the, there's a host. Then we have got Electro, which uh, is produced by cowpea. Then we have got ethylene. These are under stragalactones and they can uh, stimulate the germination of uh, uh, striga. What I want to say is that uh, these stragalactones continue to be uh, identified. So we may not know exactly how many of them are in a plant variety. If I can give you the example of uh, tobacco, I think the tobacco root can produce around 11 strigalactones. And some of these, which we have mentioned, could be included. So many stragalactones can be produced by one plant. Now, contact with the host, that is when the parasite is actually formed, the radical at the point of attachment, that is where you get uh, the Ostoria being formed. And what necessitates the formation of Ostoria is the presence of two six DMBQ or in four two six dimethoxy P benzoquinone. It's a Wostoria initiation factor. And what triggers the formation of this substance is the conduct of the radical of the uh, parasitic uh, seed on the surface of the root of the host. There are other substances which are also involved. These are phenolics, flavonoids, cytokinins. Flavonoids <coughs> and the phenolics could be arilochemicals. Cytokinins could be hormones. And it, uh, we have also a substance known as thydiazuron. Uh, which can uh, facilitate formation of Australia. This is under a microscope. If you are looking at the root structure, this is the diagram where you have the, the host, and this is part of the parasite, and the bridge is the Australia. That bridge has got uh, xylem connections. So you've got a xylem connection to the host and to the parasite. And that xylem connection facilitates the movement of uh, water from the host to the parasite.
Now, period under the underground, at this stage, the parasite is small and lacks uh, chlorophyll. It is entirely depending on the host for its uh, nutrient requirements and water requirements. This is when damage takes place and the period underground can be up to 30 days. And it may not be easy to control this uh, weight. This is why farmers uh, just leave it. Because uh, by the time when they see the weed, the crop is also damaged. So after germination, it takes 30 days underground. Then uh, after emergence, 40 to 40, uh, 30 to 40 days after emergence, it starts flowering and forming seed. And the seeds will complete the life cycle. So that would be the, the life cycle will be completed when the seed has been formed. Now I want to talk about the effects of the parasites on the host. It, these effects are variable in the sense that uh, sometimes you may not see them. In the case of uh, a tolerant uh, crop, but in a very susceptible crop, the host may actually die. So you can have uh, cereals which may be resistant or tolerant, others may be susceptible. So it varies depending on the genotype. This is why we have to do some uh, studies to identify host resistance or host tolerance. Uh, if it is in a susceptible uh, plant which is infected, normally it exhibits low stem weights and low grain yield. Sometimes we use the stem as an indication of, uh, as an indicator for tolerance. If a host has been attacked, and it maintains stem weight, it could be tolerant. This is in the Chundura communal area. It's in near Kwekwe. It's one of the places which is affected by uh, parasitic weeds. You can see this maze, you can see uh, a lot of uh, parasites in the field. You can see maize, which is wilting, even when it was uh, wet, showing the symptoms of a uh, striker infection. You can see striker underneath here. This is SC513 which was uh, attacked by striker. You can see this part here, uh, maize has got short stems. A closer look revealed that there were parasitic plants. These are the parasitic plants uh, in that uh, field.
Now the parasite the parasitic weeds can cause you know standing of internal elongation. This is why we see very short plants uh, when when there is a strike infection. Uh, wilting symptoms have already showed you the slides of maize, which is wilting, even underweight conditions. Uh, there are similarities between the physiological effects caused by drought and those caused by strike. Drought causes wilting. Striga also causes wilting uh, in maize. And there is a link of this physiological event with the abscisic acid. Because uh, Abscisic acid is responsible for the opening and the closing of the stomata. If it accumulates in the leaves, uh, the stomata will close. And once the stomata are closed, this may affect uh, the, the leaves. So sometimes by simply measuring accumulation of abscisic acid in leaves uh, under strike uh, infection, you can differentiate genotypes which are tolerant and those which are susceptible. The other thing is that uh, strike can actually reduce the rate of uh, photosynthesis in the host. Uh, the, the rate of photosynthesis simply goes down after infection. But there could be other varieties which are able to maintain their photosynthesis under strike infection. Such varieties are tolerant. And we can use measurements of photosynthesis to identify tolerant uh, genotypes. The other thing is that uh, striker can predispose sensitive cultivars to photoinhibition. There is a photo. Uh, there is a, a photosystem two, which is part of photosynthesis, which can get uh, damaged by light. And this becomes apparent when striga is infecting the plants. No wonder why the leaves turn brownish if they are damaged by photoinhibition. Probably this is what strigergesneroids can do to tobacco leaves because they turn brown after infection. What can happen is that after infection, the stomata may close. And this can reduce what is known as stomata conductance. So the infected plants will have a lower stomata conductance compared to uninfected plants. Now there are some instruments which we can use to monitor some of these effects. Uh, for example, we can uh, 
measure photosynthesis using a potable modulated chlorophyll fluorometer. We can also use infrared gas analyzer. We can also use a parameter. Some scientists were suggesting that uh, there are some measurements using infrared gas analyzer, which can quickly tell you whether a variety is tolerant or not. And it's quite uh, fast. If you are screening a large uh, number of uh, varieties. Striker can also cause phytotoxic effects on the host. Oh, this is still a hypothesis which needs to be established because uh, striker can cause dramatic uh, damage effects on the host. And scientists think that uh, this could be caused by phytotoxicity. Probably there's a substance which is phytotoxic, uh, which is being uh, formed. Now, I want to talk about the partitioning of carbohydrates within a host, uh, which is under uh, which is which has been attacked by a parasite. So I'm going to look at uh, various uh, relationships of uh, source sink interactions. We start with the relationship of uh, Electra Vogeri and its host. We can also talk about the Cascuta cambestris and its a host. Now, within these two parasites, there is a clear redirection of host resources to the parasite sink. What it means is that uh, when the parasite is, uh, is attached to the host. It will compete with, uh, with, let's say, seed formation of the host. Instead of the carbohydrates being channeled to the flowering parts where seed is being formed, the carbohydrates are now directed to the parasite. And usually the parasites form very strong link sinks for carbon and nitrogen. And this can lead to reduced seed size, reduced seed weight of the host. And eventually this will lead to low yields. Here we now look at the striker serial interaction. Now, if you compare striker and the Electra or the the Gascuta, if if we compare these two parasites with the with the striga. Striga is a, a relatively a small plant, thin plant. The other thing is that uh, this parasite can also photosynthesize. 
and they make uh, probably some contribution to its carbon requirements. So how much will it take from the host? It's a small plant. It can also manufacture its own food. That is the question. And the parasite the biomass is just a fraction of the observed difference between infected and uninfected plants. What you are saying is that uh, if you see infected plants and uninfected plants, there's a big difference in the biomass reduction where there is a striga infection. And this big biomass reduction is not found in the striga plants which are very small so if we're measuring the weight the, the mass of the striga and you find the difference in terms of biomass striga biomass cannot explain what has happened to the other biomass of the affected uh, plants. I hope you are following me. So the question is, where is the biomass going if we cannot find it in the striker plants? Actually, there were scientists who actually demonstrated that uh, they used what they called the carbon balance model which clearly showed that uh, Striga was only taking 20% of the carbon from its host, and 80% was unaccounted for. So where was that 80% uh, going? What was really happening? So the explanation could be uh, related to some of these issues. In the striga serial interaction, maybe the leaf area of the host, which is uh, reduced, and the the rate of photosynthesis, which is also reduced, probably could account for other carbon losses. Because we now have uh, small leaf areas, low rates of photosynthesis. Probably this is where this is how carbon is being lost. The one which we think should be taken by striker. Also, low stomata conductance. If you reduce stomata conductance, it, it means that uh, carbon dioxide is applied to the leaf for photosynthesis is also reduced. There's also increase in photorespiration uh, metabolism which may also contribute to the uh, reduction of the rate of uh, photosynthesis. In fact, the striga is well known for the photorespiratory uh, process. In photorespiration, what is happening is that uh, Rubisco, which is the enzyme which facilitates fixation of carbon dioxide. It is also facilitating the breakdown of, uh, it is actually reducing the formation of uh, glucose within the striga. 
So what may be happening is that uh, although Striga is getting glucose from the from its host, it's simply burning it, destroying it, without even using it because of photorespiration. The other thing which could be happening is something to do with the plant growth regulators. Now, biomass allocation within the host, you have it a lot of carbohydrates going to the root, limiting what is going to the shoot. So you could also have a shorter internodes in the infected uh, plants. And uh, probably the whole structure of the plant or architecture is altered. Once the whole architecture is altered, it may also contribute to the inefficiency of the photosynthesis which will now uh, take place probably due to leaf shedding very few leaves will be exposed to light uh, for photosynthesis the other issue is something to do with the hormonal balance. We've got the abscisic acid, gibberellins, cytokinins, may also contribute in the changes of the architecture, which can also reduce the photosynthesis. Even uh, ABA can actually close the stomata and reduce uh, uh, photosynthesis. So there are a lot of processes which can account for the losses caused by Striga, and they may not simply be explained by abstraction of uh, uh, carbohydrates in the water by the parasite. It's beyond that. So that's it for the biology of parasitic weeds. I will stop here for, for a while.